respect in the library of a traditional Islamic scholar, again, showing the, the, the kind of intellectual horizon um, that you know, characterized uh, Zakir Badawi. Again, I would like to thank first and foremost Fadis Badawi for his generosity, for choosing UCC to give um, his father's personal library uh, to. I would also like to thank John Fitzgerald and you know, UCC Library and itself in general for facilitating, helping us, you know, providing logistical, personal support, um, dealing with you know, utmost patience with our requests and so on. Um, and also I would like to, to thank you know, Michael Murphy, the president of UCC, for additional financial support that his office has provided in order to facilitate the cataloging of the collection. We felt it would be most befitting to invite Professor Tariq Ramadan to launch this collection today, despite difference, differences in terms of intellectual outlook, religious orientation, personality, generation, and so on. Um, I think there are all these <laughs> synergies um, and um, uh, affinities between both, and that was meant as a compliment, of course. Um, you know, despite these differences, um, I think both have been very eager to establish a public recognizable space for Islam in Europe, um, you know, that the presence of Islam is recognized as an essential feature, as an essential component of contemporary European societies, that the presence of Islam is a normality in Europe, while at the same time arguing for or you know, articulating an understanding of Islamic identity that sees itself thoroughly European and embraces the social norms and values of European societies. Professor Tarek Ramadan was born in Switzerland, studied philosophy and French literature at the University of Geneva and was a PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies of the same university. He is a prolific writer on Islam in general, on Islamic Muslims in Europe more specifically, um, a distinguished academic who I think quite interestingly you know, combines his academic work, his publishing work with grassroots level community activities. He's professor of contemporary Islamic studies at Oxford University, based at the very prestigious St. Anthony's College there. It is a great pleasure, a great honor indeed, to welcome Professor Ramadan to Toronto. <laughs>
at the same time, something which was important and we were talking about is that he traveled a lot. And this is a very important point when it comes to faithfulness to the text, with traveling a lot and, 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 and uh, uh, being able to assess the environment is something which is very important. Understanding that it's not enough only to, to understand the texts, you need to understand the people. You need to listen to what the people are experiencing in their daily life, their cultures, their environment. And he did that in, 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 uh, in Africa, and he did that, of course, in Arab uh, countries. In Africa, he went, he was in Nigeria for, for, for many years. And then in Britain and in the European uh, continent, he carried on uh, uh, this uh, double understanding.
you understood Islam when you came should not be the way you are implementing Islam when you stay. It's the same Islam, it's not the same environment. So they need to get uh, a knowledge of what first. It's the environment. You need to get the society. And this is why it's important not only to read books on Islam written by Muslim scholars about Islamic texts, but to, to read about social issues, politics, dynamics, sociology, anthropology. These are social and human sciences that you need to get if you want to get the sense uh, uh, of who you are. And he was, in an informal way, something that afterward I came back to this understanding, something which is essential here. At the end of the day, we need to work on the sense of belonging. British Muslims should belong to the country. And they should feel so. And you get this by uh, uh, focusing on means and ends. One of the means is the language. So that's good that you come back by, you know, the books are in Arabic, and you need to read Arabic to get the knowledge of the text, because the text was revealed in Arabic, but you are in Britain, and you, have to go to, you need to get a good knowledge of English in this country, because this is the means of communication. And if Islam is a universal value, it doesn't mean that Arab, the Arabic language should be everywhere and only the Arabic language. Is that the Arabic language as a reference is going to be everywhere, but all the other languages should be uh, uh, spoken by the Muslims. And this, this is something that he was also addressing in the Muslim college, with the Arabic, but also the English, and something which was also in the service on Friday. Friday, you don't have to speak only Arabic just to make it Islamic uh, and confusing <laughs> Islamic with the Arabic language, you have to talk to people the language they understand. And this is, he was part of this movement that was, you know, at the beginning it was very difficult with it with the Muslims, because some of them, you know, in the Arabic setting it was, Arabic is the only language. And if you were to go to the Pakistani brothers and sisters, Urdu, <laughs> no way. <laughs> because English is the, the language of the colonizers. Confusing politics with the means is just, uh, uh, and you have exactly the same with Turkish language and people being in the Turkish setting. And this is where this understanding at the beginning, in the 70s, 80s, being able to say this, it's a, a very important legacy, it's a very important contribution saying, be careful, think about the ends and the goals and reassess the way you deal with the means. And this is the way you understand uh, 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 your religion, so language, culture, uh, and what I was saying was also very important. You know, once we were in an interfaith uh, dialogue with the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he was there, and he wa I was listening to him <coughs> while he was talking, and there is something that I, I realized by listening to him talking English and translating from Arabic, is that he was not translating literally was translating the meaning. So sometimes he was adapting the terminology, not because he was playing with the people, but he was faithful to the content, the substance, the essence of the message. And this is something which is tremendously important. At the end of the day, when you are living in a country, the point is not to translate from Arabic to Brit British or English, I mean, or, or to French or, or, or German language. You need to get the essence of the message and to translate with the right words, the right meaning, not only the literal meaning, just to show that you know Arabic. And this is something which was very important. Mm -hmm. uh, some people in order, and, and we have this in, 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 in Britain or in Ireland or in, in Europe, some people, because they want to show that they know Arabic, they tend to translate in a literalist way the words say, you know, I have a good comment of Arabic. The point is not to have a good comment of Arabic. It's not because you speak Arabic that you are a good Muslim. If it was the case, it would have been known. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you know what I mean. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is to get the right understanding of the message. And, and this is where you have to know the two languages and, and to get the word. And he was on this very, very uh, 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 present in this scene of interface dialogue. And you said it. I think it's very important to acknowledge the fact that in many settings in the West, in, not only, by the way, not only in Europe, everywhere, he was very much involved in discussing, listening, and sharing with people about his views and uh, uh, understanding his time. And I think that on this, uh, 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 the legacy that he left on this was, was very important. On the 
understanding that intricate dialogue is not to convince the other that you are right, but uh, to listen to what the other has to say to understand why they think they are right, not what you think about them, but the way they deal with them. So this dialogue, which is starting by listening, and not only trying to convince. Now, uh, the second thing that I wanted to say here, to, say to, to a series of things as a second part of my talk, is uh, that, in, as you said, in our encounters over the years, uh, I was listening to him. I, w I took a lot, and, and this is why, you, you know, how do you deal with people in history? It is always to be selective. He was, he gave, he, 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 he gave a lot, and there are things that we may agree or not. And this is the point that we have in many issues. He was, he, he, he liked challenging the community, challenging even the scholars, like who's coming by, by views that were not really mainstream. They were not. And then sometimes he was challenging on issues, for example, and going very far when it came to things that had to do with army, with even, even voting, for example. Mm -hmm. And remember that on TV, once on Channel 4, we had a debate about is it an obligation to vote or not? And his position is it's a religious obligation. And then my position was it's an ethical obligation and not religious. You know, I'm happy when we read it. And at the end, and this is it, this is the point that we were not uh, in agreement with it, we were respecting each other. And this yeah. is where I yeah. think that our Western experience, and he was one of, of the people challenging, you know, the common uh, <coughs> understanding, something that if we are so used to it that we think it's the only right way to think, he was challenging this. And then at the end, he came with his own views. I think that some of them were not right. I think that some of them were disputable, but at least we were in a dialogue, a critical dialogue. And I think that this is where you come back to the very beginning of this time, where the scholars were not agreeing, but they were respecting each other. They were not putting the people, you are outside Islam or we are in. No one has the right to put someone within or outside. So this is why he was not like this. He was sometimes very sharp, sometimes very critical, but always respectful in the views that he can have. Sometimes even with literalists, it was not easy. With people who were very literalists, they were even not considering him as a true Muslim. He was facing people putting him outside Islam. And still, he carried on his work. And I think that this is quite important to understand that uh, uh, in all these discussions and sometimes controversy, uh, uh, the debates were uh, open and the discussions were possible. And uh, uh, the, the, the point also on this is, is also, you, you were saying that what I, I have been trying to do is always to connect academia and grassroots uh, uh, activists. And this is the way he was himself. He was at the, uh, talking to scholars and in academic settings, and at the same time, very close to the community. I saw him in very small gatherings, talking to Muslims and challenging the Muslims, listening to what they had to say. And I think that this is the way we want the scholar to be is really to be connected to the community, uh, sometimes very much criticized by Muslims and some organizations, and still being here and challenging and saying, uh, I have these views on that, and uh, no one can say, or could have been uh, able to say he's not trained, but this was not true. And I think that on this, uh, uh, it was an important point. So my conclusion here is, uh, through the books that he is uh, uh, leaving and through this uh, 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 legacy, uh, what is important for students, what is important for uh, a, a university or college is really to keep this and to make it uh, available for the students. These are books, and you have, of course, very, very classical books, you know, Bukhari, Muslim, all what you need to, to get if you want it to be a scholar, but also opening the doors in Arabic, and this is something which is important uh, also is to have Arabic books on social issues and, and questions of our time, which is also important to read. So this is a way, a means for a university to spread knowledge. And if we are serious about uh, interfaith, if we are serious about not teaching, you know, uh, in a confessional way, but in an academic way, we need to have books in all the fields and in all languages. So it's a good contribution that you are making here. And I think that uh, it's important. The second thing which is important, the second concept that I will 
uh, keep out of his contribution is after knowledge, this understanding. At the end of the day, I always remember what Oluwak uh, Nukhantar was saying. It's uh, one of the, the companions of the, the, the messenger of peace be upon him. When he said, he said, el fahm, el fahm, el fahm. Understanding, understanding, understanding. We need to understand, not to gain knowledge, but to understand what you know. If not, you are only a computer. And be careful with the people who are confusing knowledge with computers. That's to understand what I mean. <laughs> but this is the point. I think understanding is, is important. And the last thing which is important, and, and in some gathering, uh, I, I heard him coming back to this. And I think that I want to end this uh, with one uh, of the most important dimensions that we have in all our uh, knowledge of Islam. Understanding Islam and the world, and at the end of the day, is never to forget the meaning of everything, which is the very essence of spirituality. And I think if, the, if there is something that we need to keep, even if we are not teaching professions and the way to be a good Christian or a way to be a good Muslim, but teaching religion, it's always important to reconcile academia and spirituality, not to make it possible to teach about the religion as if we're not teaching, teaching spirituality. Spirituality is part of, of the very essence of religion. So how do we academically teach spirituality was the challenge of uh, uh, what he was trying to do in his life. And I, and I think that uh, this is a big question. It's not, it's not easy. It's not easy to be able in academic, in an academic way with academic words and terminology to make it clear that at the end when we teach religion, we teach something which has to do with meaningful people. It's meaningful people. It's not a, it's not a, a, a framework. It's meaning. It's emotions. It is sacred. How do you teach in an academic way the sacred dimension of life? I think that sometimes when we, we were with him in, in a very close setting, this was something which was very important. Know how to pray, but never forget why you pray, which is a good academic question. Thank you.